Hello and welcome to Mathematics 4. I'm going to start by giving some information about this course and then we'll cover the first four topics. An introduction, some examples of differential equations, we'll talk about how to draw a direction field, and then we'll see how to solve our first differential equations. I'm expecting to give approximately 12 classes to you. They'll be on Wednesdays and Thursdays between 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock. And my style of teaching is, first, I'm going to give you a lecture. And that we can assume that that takes approximately 60 minutes. And then in the second hour, or however long we have left, I will be available to answer your questions, to do extra examples, or whatever you want to do. The second half of each lesson is up to you to decide how we use it. Maybe you don't have an hour's worth of questions. If that's true, then we can finish early. That's OK. I said the lecture would be approximately 60 minutes, but some week, some lessons, I might be more than 60 minutes, and some lessons, I might be a little bit less than 60 minutes. <coughs> I've tried to front load the topics, uh, by which I mean at the start of the course we'll be doing, when we're doing the easier topics, I'll try and do, I'll try and cover lots of topics, which means that when we get to the hard stuff at the end, I can slow down and I can give you shorter lessons with, with just covering a small amount of difficult material. I've broken this, the material up into five sections, which you'll see five chapters in the lecture notes. First, we'll do the introduction. We'll cover first order differential equations, second and higher order linear differential equations. We'll talk about how we can use the Laplace transform. And in the final chapter, we'll look at systems of first order linear differential equations. I'm going to use three lectures to cover the first two chapters and then three lectures to, to cover each of the final three chapters. This is why some lessons might be slightly longer than 60 minutes and some lectures might be a little bit less than 60 minutes because I want to break the topics up like this. I've written lecture notes for you. You can find this in the content material section. You can print this out or read this on your phone or your screen whenever you wish. The lecture notes and the slides are almost exactly the same, just formatted differently. I am going to assess this course using some homework and some exams. Let me just preface this. I'm telling you the plan, but if I if the university changes its mind or it tells us what to do to do something different later, then the information on this slide might change. There will be homework, there will be one midterm exam, and there will be one final exam. The homework will consist of 10 multiple choice tests. The first two, I think, are already available to you. You can do, I will set the deadline for the homework to one day before the final exam. So if you really want to, you can wait until the end of the course before doing the homework, but I think that would be a bad idea. I suggest you try to finish the homework as soon as possible. Try to do one or two pieces of homework every week. Sometimes students um, suffer technical issues when they're doing the homework. If you leave it to the last minute, then you won't have time to ask for technical support. Try to do the homework earlier rather than later and check that your answers have been saved. And because it's a multiple choice test, as soon as you finish the homework, you'll get your score. The midterm exam will be an online exam, I'm assuming so, on OLAN, and the final exam will be online as well. If I was teaching this course to you in a classroom, then we would have eight hours of lectures every week. And for each one of these hours of lecture, I would be expecting you to study another one to two hours outside of the class. So 
that would be between 16 and 24 hours of study each week, I would be expecting of it. This is an online course. We only have four hours of class each week, but still, I would expect you to be studying the same between 16 and 24 hours each week for this course. So that means somewhere between 12 and 20 hours each week, you should, I would be expecting you to study by yourself. I would, you might be doing the online homework tests each week. You can rewatch the lectures if you want. I'll make them available on both OLearn on, and on YouTube. There's lecture notes or lecture slides. You can read them before the lecture or after the lecture, whatever you want. The lecture notes have lots of exercises for you to work on, and most of them have solutions in the back. There's a discussion board on OLearn where you can ask questions to me, or you can ask, you can discuss with other students. You might want to read books about this topic. I'm going to, to suggest two good books. You might want to watch online videos by other lecturers. Two good books for this course, which in the past years we've made required, one of them is required purchases, but for your course they are optional. Voices Elementary Differential Equations and Boundary Value Problems, or Elementary Differential Equations with Boundary Value Problems by Edwards and Penny are both very good books about differential equations. You might like to try to find a copy of one of these books to read while, we, while we're studying this course. You might have noticed I have a slide number down the bottom corner. This will give you an idea as to roughly how far through the lecture we are. And if you're following along in the lecture notes, there's the current section at the top, so you know where to look in the lecture notes. Now, an introduction to differential equations. If I said solve x plus 3 is equal to 5, then what I'm asking for is a number x which satisfies this equation. But if I said solve dy dx is equal to 2x, then this time I don't want a number. Instead, I'm looking for a function y of x which satisfies this equation. A differential equation is an equation which contains a derivative. dy dx is equal to 2x is an equation. This equation includes a derivative, so this is a differential equation. For example, solve dy dx is equal to 2x. This is straightforward. Students which have studied first year calculus can solve this because by the fundamental theorem of calculus, y of x is the same as the integral of dy dx dx. When we put in 2x and integrate, we get x squared plus c. The solution to this differential equation is y is equal to x squared plus c. Or I might give you a problem like this. Solve dy dx is equal to 2x with another condition, the condition that y of 0 is equal to 5. In this problem, we've got two lines, two conditions to satisfy. The first line, dy dx equal to 2x, is a differential equation. The second line, y is equal, y of 0 equal to 5, is called an initial condition. And the whole problem altogether is called an initial value problem. An initial value problem I'm going to be abbreviating in this course as IVP. Anytime you see IVP, it means a problem containing a differential equation and at least one initial condition. 
we know a solution to the differential equation. We know that the solution is x squared plus c. We need to choose the value of c <coughs> which satisfies the initial condition. So we can calculate. We want y of 0 to be equal to 5. So I start with this. I'm just writing it in the opposite way around. 5 is equal to y of 0. But y of 0 is this must be the same as 0 squared plus c or c. So we can see that we must have c equal to 5. Now we can write down the solution to the initial value problem. The solution to the initial value problem is y is equal to x squared plus 5. Another initial value problem. Solve dy dx is equal to sine x with the initial condition y of 0 is equal to 3. First, we're going to solve the differential equation, and then we're going to choose the correct value of c to satisfy the second line. So solving the differential equation, again, use the fundamental theorem of calculus. y is equal to the integral of dy dx dx. First, of course, the integral of sine is minus cos. So we have y is equal to minus cos x plus c. This is the solution to the differential equation. Next, we need to choose c. Starting with 3 is equal to y of 0. y of 0 is minus cos 0 plus c, or minus 1 plus c. And we can see that we must have c is equal to 4. So we can write down the answer. The solution is y is equal to minus cos x plus 4. So dy dx is equal to y. This looks easy, but it's, we can't use the same method that we've used before. We can't just integrate dy dx to find y of x, because dy dx is equal to y. I'm going to show you how to solve this equation later today. First, let's look at some examples from science. Many problems in engineering science, social sciences, etc., can be modeled using different equations. We're going to start by looking at three examples. First example, suppose we have an object of mass 10 kilograms, which is falling. V of t will be the velocity pointing downwards. We expect that the gravity affects the velocity of the object, and we also expect that the drag of the object affects the velocity of the object. Vt is going to be the velocity of the object in the downwards direction, and I'm going to measure this in meters per second. And t is going to be the time in seconds. We use Newton's second law, force is equal to mass times acceleration. The mass is 10 kilograms, and the acceleration is the derivative of velocity, dv dt. What are the forces acting on the object? We have gravity, which points in the same direction as velocity. So gravity we consider to be positive. Drag is pointing in the opposite direction from velocity, so drag will be a negative force. On the Earth, you grab a, an object of mass telegrams, mass 10 kilograms has a gravity force acting on it of, of 10 g, where g is, let's say, 9.8 meters per second squared. We can assume, as long as the object is not traveling too quickly, that the drag is proportional to the velocity. There's a symbol for proportional. It's this symbol here. Proportional means it's equal to a constant multiplied by. So it's reasonable for, reasonable for us to assume that the drag is equal to some constant gamma multiplied by the velocity, where gamma is going to be a positive number, which depends on the shape of the object. 
What does that mean? That means that we have something which is aerodynamic or streamlined. We would expect gamma to be a small positive number. If the shape of the object causes a lot of drag, like a parachute, then we expect gamma to be a large positive number. For our object, let's assume that gamma is equal to 2 kilograms per second. If we assume that gamma is 2, then mass times acceleration is equal to force, which is equal to gravity minus drag. That's 10g minus gamma v, or 98 minus 2v. Divide both sides by 10, and we get dv dt is equal to 9.8 minus v over 5. The velocity of our falling object is governed by the differential equation dv dt is equal to 9.8 minus v over 5. We're going to solve this equation later today. But first, I want to look at the, this differential equation's direction field to try to understand what is happening. Direction field is a grid of arrows, in, in this case the TV plane, which showed slope of solutions to a differential equation. The direction field for our differential equation looks like this. In the next section, I will show you how to draw a direction field. For now, let's look at what's happening here. Let's see what we can learn about the solutions to our differential equation from this direction field. Let's suppose that we start at, let's say, y0 equal to 54. In other words, we're going to start just here at the orange spot. The arrow says the solution goes downwards. So there we go. There's a little bit of solution. We go down, and we get to the next row of arrows, which say still go down, but not quite as fast. And then we keep going, we keep going down and down and down, but not quite as fast, following the, following the directions of the arrows. I'm expecting that a solution looks something like this. So here we are, plotted with a computer. This is a solution to, which starts with y0 equal to 54. Let's do another one. We can then guess at some more solutions. We started at 60, say. Again, the arrows say the solution goes downwards, so the solution should look like this. If we started at 42, or at another point, we'd expect the solutions to look like this. Solutions always follow the directions that the arrows are pointing. And we expect that somewhere in the middle, in this case at 49, there would be a constant solution. How did I know that it would be constant at 49? Well, note that if V is 49, if we put 49 into the differential equation, dV dt is equal to 9.8 minus 9.8 or 0. In other words, if V is 49, the slope is always 0 v is 49, then we have a constant solution, and this is called an equilibrium solution. Next example. We'll come back to the falling object later, but let's move on to the next example for now. Now let's suppose that pt denotes the population of mice in an area, and now t is going to be time measured in months. We're going to assume that there's plenty of mice, plenty of food for the mice to eat. So if nothing eats the mice, then we're going to expect that Pt increases at a rate proportional to Pt. In other words, we're going to assume that dp dt is equal to a constant multiplied by P. 
where the constant is going to be some positive number. And just to make this a little bit easier, let's put a number in. Let's assume that the constant is 0 0.5. So we're going to be looking at the differential equation dp dt is equal to p divided by 2. However, that was if nothing eats the max. Let's suppose that's not true. Let's suppose that there are also five owls in this area, and suppose that each owl eats three mice each day. So one owl eats three mice per day, the five owls eat 15 mice each day, and if we assume that the month has 30 days in, that means that 45 mice are eaten per month. We need to add information to our differential equation. We're going to change our differential equation to dp dt is equal to p over 2 minus 450. We should think of it this way. The p over 2 at the start is how many baby mice are born each month. And then the minus 450 is how many mice die each month. It's worth looking at a direction field for this equation. It looks like this. And we can guess at some solutions. Following the arrows, we can guess that the solutions look like this. We haven't solved the differential equation yet, but we already know what the solutions will look like. How We already know how the solutions will behave. Our third and final example is an example of a cup of coffee. Newton's law of calling states that the temperature of an object changes at a rate proportional to the difference between its temperature and that of its surroundings. We're going to suppose that the temperature of, of your cup of coffee obeys Newton's law of calling we're going to suppose that it has a temperature of 90 degrees when it's freshly poured, in other words, at time zero. And we're going to suppose that the temperature of your room is 20 degrees centigrade. Write a differential equation for the temperature of your coffee. OK. So we're expecting a cup of coffee to cool like this. Our room is at 20, and at time zero, the cup of coffee is at 90 degrees. The difference between 20 and 90 is quite a bit, so we're expecting that the coffee to cool down quickly to start with. However, as it cools down and gets closer to 20, is going to still be cooling, but the rate of cooling will decrease. So we're expecting a curve like this. When the coffee is hot, it's going to cool quickly. When the temperature of the coffee is just above 20, it's going to cool more slowly. Let KT be the temperature of your coffee in degrees centigrade, and let T be time measured in minutes. Newton's law of calling says that decay dt is proportional to the difference between the temperature of the room and the temperature of the coffee. In other words, decay dt is some constant r multiplied by 20 minus k. But is r a positive constant or a negative constant? Because hot coffee cools down, and cold coffee warms up, it makes sense that we must have that R is a positive number. Section 1.3 is about how to draw a direction. Just 
to preface this, consider y is equal to mx for different values of m. For example, y is equal to 2x is a line which slopes up from slope 2. We're going to be drawing arrows with the same slopes. So, for example, if we find dy dx is equal to 2, we're going to be drawing an arrow which slopes up at the same slope as y is equal to 2x. If we find dy dx is equal to half, say, we're going to be drawing a line with the same slope as y is equal to half x, and so on. For example, draw a direction field for dy dx is equal to x plus y. We need a grid. I'm going to draw a direction field for between minus 2.5 and 2.5 on both the x and y axes. <coughs> so I have a lattice of points and I have 11 points by 11 points or 121 points on this lattice. I'm going to need to draw 121 arrows on this direction field. First, I'm going to calculate the value of dy dx at a few points. For example, if x and y are both zero, we can put zero and zero into the equation. 0 plus 0 is equal to 0. dy dx is equal to 0. That means we must have a little arrow with slope 0. At the point 1, 0, we do x plus y, 1 plus 0, 1. We expect to have a little arrow here of slope 1, and so on. At the point 2, 0, our little arrow must have slope 2. At minus 1, 0, the slope must be minus 1, and so on. At the point minus 1, minus 1, we do x plus y, and we find that our little arrow must have slope minus 2. Let me clear this up a little bit. So far, I've calculated the slopes at 10 points and I've drawn 10 little arrows. I don't need to calculate the slope at all 121 points because from these 10, po these 10 little arrows, I can understand what is happening and I can start guessing. We're going to look for patterns and we're going to make guesses. For example, let's suppose we looked down this diagonal line. There's three arrows on this, th this diagonal line, and they're all horizontal arrows. They're all arrows of slope zero. It's reasonable to guess that all of the arrows along here, this line, all have slope zero. So we can just fill this in straight away. Very quickly, we can draw some more arrows draw another eight arrows up of slope zero. We can look at horizontal lines. What's happening as we go from left to right along this horizontal line? It looks like the arrows are rotating anti-clockwise as we move along here. Now that we understand this, we can make a guess at the other seven arrows. And we can guess that they look like this. We can also look at vertical lines. What's happening here as we go from the bottom to the top? Again, the arrows seem to be rotating anti-clockwise. So we can make a guess. We can fill in all of the arrows on this line. Keep making guesses and you can fill in all 121 arrows quite quickly. And it should look like this. Another example, draw a direction field for dy dx is equal to xy. If you're re-watching the video of this lecture, I suggest you pause it here 
quickly try to draw it yourself and then click clone. I'm going to show you the answer now. Hopefully, the one that you drew looks like this. Another one, draw a directing field for dy dx is y x plus y. Again, if you're re-watching this video, pause it here and try to draw this yourself. I'm going to show you the answer now. And then we come to the final section that we're going to look at today. Solving our first differential equations. <coughs> We looked at the equation dv dt is 9.8 minus v over 5. That was the equation for the falling object. And we looked at dp dt equal to p over 2 minus 450. That was the equation for the mice and the owls. Both of these equations are of the form dy dt equal to ay minus b, where a and b are constants. In this section, we're going to look to see how can we solve equations like this. Let's do mice and owls first. The PDT, and I'm choosing to write this as P minus 900 divided by 2. As, and you will see why soon. If P is not 900, then we can rearrange this equation. I'm going to pretend that dp dt means dp divided by dt. And I'm going to pretend that we can multiply both sides by dt, or in other words, move the dt up to the right. And then I'm going to take the p minus 900, divide both sides by p minus 900, or move this over to the left side. To get dp divided by p minus 900 is equal to half dt. Now, notice what I've done here. I've mo moved all of the terms which have p in them to the left, and I've moved all of the terms involved in t to the right hand side of the equal sign. In other words, I've separated the variables. Now, just to be careful, of course, dp dt does not really mean dp divided by dt. Um, this, the method I'm showing you now sometimes annoys pure mathematicians, but we won't worry about that because this method works. Later in the course, I'll show you the way to, inverted commas, do this method properly. In other words, the way that the, the pure mathematicians really want us to do it. But, for the time being, let's just use the easy method, which works. The key idea is, if we can separate the variables like this, then we're allowed to integrate. And it's only if we can separate the variables. If we can't separate the variables, then the method I'm going to show you doesn't work. We're not allowed to integrate. This method only works if we can separate the variables so that all of the p terms are on the left and all of the t terms are on the right. We're allowed to integrate this equation. In other words, we're allowed to put an integral sign on the left-hand side and an integral sign on the right-hand side. The integral of dp divided by p minus 900 is equal to the integral of a half dt. The integral of 1 divided by p minus 900 is the natural logarithm of the absolute value of p minus 900. And the integral of a half is t divided by 2. And of course, we need a constant of integration. We only need one constant. Yes, we're doing two integrals, but it doesn't matter. We can combine the constants together and just say plus k on the end. 
I want to rearrange this equation to solve for p. And I do it like this. If the natural logarithm of etc. etc. is t over 2 plus k, we can take the exponential function of both sides to get so the absolute value of p minus 900 is equal to e to the power t over 2 plus k. Instead of e to the power t over 2 plus k, I can write this as e to the power k multiplied by e to the power t over 2. I want to get rid of the absolute value signs. I don't want these here. I can get rid of these as long as I add a plus or minus somewhere. I can write p minus 900 is plus or minus e to the power k, e to the power t over 2. Take the 900 over to the right, we get pt is equal to 900, plus or minus e to the power k, e to the power t over 2. We're not quite finished. We can simplify this a little bit. What is k? k is a constant. k is a number that we don't know yet. It's just some number. So e to the power k is a number that we don't know. Like a positive number, but still it's a number that we don't know. It's just some number. So plus or minus e to the power k is a number that we don't know. Some number, any number. We can give this a new name. Instead of writing plus or minus e to the power k, we can just give this a new name. We can just call this c. c is a number that we don't know. Put this into the solution. We have pt is equal to 900 plus c e to the power t over 2. This is the solution to the mice and owls equation. And we can do the same thing for the falling object equation. Solve dv dt is equal to 9.8 minus v over 5. Here's the method. This time I've written the whole method in one go. Let's go through this slowly. We're starting with dv dt is equal to 9.8 minus v over 5. And I want to start rearranging this equation. So first I'm writing this as 49 minus v over 5 because 49 divided by 5 is equal to 9.8. And then I want to separate the variables. I want to move all of the v terms to the left, and I want to move all of the t terms to the right. I'm choosing to keep a minus sign on the right. You'll see why soon. I'm taking v minus 49 to the left, and I'm bringing dt to the right hand side. So I have all of the V terms on the left and all of the T terms on the right. If we can do this, if we can separate the variables, then we're allowed to integrate. So we are allowed to write that the integral of dV divided by V minus 49 is equal to the integral of minus one fifth dT. Now, why did I leave the minus sign on the right-hand side? It's just to make this integral a little bit easier for myself. The integral of 1 divided by v minus 49 is the natural logarithm of v minus 49. If I had the minus sign over here on the left, I would need to um, worry about that. Because I've left it on the right-hand side, it's easy to do. The integral of minus one fifth, of course, is minus t over five, and then we need a constant, which I'm going to say is plus k.
take the exponential of both sides. And then instead of writing absolute value, we can add in a plus or minus. So, so far I've got V minus 49 is equal to plus or minus e to the power k, e to the power minus t over 5. Take the 49 over to the right side. V must be 49 plus or minus e to the power k, e to the power minus t over 5. Let's do the same trick as we did before. Instead of this complicated looking plus or minus e to the power k, let's just call this c. 49 plus c e to the power minus t over 5. And that is the end of this week's lesson. As I said, some weeks I will be less than an hour, some weeks I will be a little bit more. For the first week, I've made this a little bit less than an hour. Next week, so no, sorry, next time, tomorrow, we're going to be looking at sections 1.5 and then the first three sections of chapter two. We'll talk about classification, Linear equations, separable equations, and the differences between linear and nonlinear equations. Are there any questions? I should say the pass mark for this course will be 40 points, 40 points for grade DD. And remember that the homework is worth 20 points. So if you do the homework, if you do well on the homework, you're halfway to passing the course already. So please start on the first homework this week, get the points in the bank, and then you'll be ready for the exams. If you do well on the homework and if you do well on the midterm exam, then you'll almost pass the course before we get to the final exam.